six, seven years ago, SMC was decent. Now when I see those same trades that I used to take, they're not working as they used to. SMC has now become retail and I can vouch for it because I've seen it. Because now in my strategy, I trade against SMC. But my belief is everything has to be with data. You can't just be like, oh, I saw this head and shoulder pattern work last week, so it worked. No, no, you need to show me a thousand trades. Trading an edge is a foundation and then your psychology is on top. If you try and build a good psychology on a flawed, non-proven system, you're trying to have affirmations and belief and you're trying to meditate on a strategy that doesn't work. It's a waste of time. Water sports accidents are up. Ice cream does not cause deaths in water sports. You just found a correlation. If I take a lighter and I put it on some gas, it's going to cause a fire. It's a causation. Direct link. Then you have to find what are the causations in the market. So what is driving price? What is truly moving the market? I believe. Folks, we've got Walker Asim in the house today. He's a very experienced Forex trader, trades GU and EU on a daily basis on the one minute time frame, and he's been publicly displaying his trades on X or Twitter for the past couple of months and made a 40% return. You're going to find out not just all about that, but he's got a ton of advice in the show. It's one of these shows where you're probably going to listen, want to listen to it a few times and it may be the only show you need to get you going in the right direction as a trader. Right, so that's what's coming up. Now, after the show, what we did was we shot a video which went for about an hour where he breaks down what he does on a price chart. Now, that's coming up on the channel, so make sure you do not miss that because it will show you exactly what's going on with smart money traders, the traps that are involved, and how to make the most out of it. So it's an epic video. It's going to be dropped in two parts here on Trading Nut. All right, folks, enough from me. Before we get in, though, we're going to see how I'm getting on with my Blue Guardian Challenge and then jump into the interview. Folks, here's my update for the Blue Guardian Challenge. So you can see here, not the best of weeks. Started off at break even and then three losers in a row. I can't believe it. It was the strategy. No excuses there. That's just how played out then I had a, a win here which should have been a bit bigger but the bot got me out early there's a bug in the bot I've realized so I'm gonna need to fix that and then the last but not least left the trade ready for Friday and it brought me back down to that 3% so I probably should have just ended the week um, the weird thing was the euro US dollar trade that took me back down here actually played out on gold and would have been a good trade on gold so I don't know why that just didn't work on euro they looked exactly the same anyway if you guys want to take your own blue guardian challenge there's a link in the description 10 cent off or on word trading that let's get on with the show all right folks here we are on trading up we've got Waka Asim in the house all the way over there in Dubai welcome to the show Waka thank you very much Cam, for moving on well look so he's a podcaster a trader First and foremost, a trader, a podcaster as well. You've got the Titans of uh, Tomorrow as your podcast, tomorrow. and you're also a businessman. So we're going to hear all of that today and dive heavily into the trading aspect. So folks, this is going to be an epic show. So to start off with, for the guys that don't know you, can you just give you a, give us a pot of the history of how you got into trading and your sort of journey sure. today? Yeah, I'll give you the what they call the elevator pitch. So I've got about a minute, 30 seconds. I'm in the elevator and I've got to describe myself. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, very briefly, uh, as you know, um, I come from a very traditional Asian family. So education was number one and we, a middle-class family, but all of our money was not spent on vacations. It was spent on education. So extra homework for me, weekends, not out with friends. It was with a tutor. Um, but I think it instilled good habits in me and, you know, that working hard mentality. And, but that also made me conform to the system very strongly pushing towards schooling, education, university. And I did excel in that environment. My my GCSE grades were all A stars. A levels were all A grades. Ended up at university doing dentistry. Um, and, you know, for, for an Asian family, for an Asian boy, that is like the best you can do. It's, it's, a, it's a dentist or it's a lawyer or engineer or a doctor. So I chose the dental path. And I think it was a good career choice um, if I was to stay in like the nine to five realm. Um, but just my nature is I'm a non-conformist. I don't like being told what to do and and having a boss, just my personality type. So um, when I was at university and I had my peers around me from wealthier backgrounds, I felt that I couldn't keep up with the restaurants and the fun they were doing. And six years is a long time. So eventually I do look to online ways to make money, drop shipping, Amazon and so forth. In fact, I even had a drop shipping store, uh, which I haven't told many people, called Pearly Dent. Uh, I thought I'm a dentist. Let me do these whitening kits from China, whatever. And I realized, okay, these Chinese gels and products are probably not the best. I, I scrapped all of that, but I tried it all. Eventually you do come across trading and my journey is very typical to most where you see the flashy stuff online and you get roped into it and then you take losses and then you strat bounce from strategy to strategy and eventually you fall in love with it. And I think trading, no one has a calling or a passion for it. 
It's something you come in for one reason only, which is money. And then when you div, when you dive deeper into it, you realize it's not just money. It's a bit of status, a bit of get rich quick. You know, there's a lot of uh, reasons men get into the industry, and it's specifically men, and it's because of our ego and and so forth. And it ties nicely into how prop firms actually work, which we can speak on, uh, because I think it's all a status, money driven industry, and therefore the participants that are milking the industry and the and the innocent traders, let's say, they lean into that. Or if you feel insecure, or you they try and solve all of your problems. Say, oh, you you don't have enough money. You don't, you know your social circle is in this. You're not able to get girls, whatever it is. And they kind of say your solution is trading by my X Y Z. Um, yeah, so I fell into all of that. Uh, so I was I was buying courses. I was even doing signals, the broker sign up stuff. And I was like, you know, you you realize after a bit of time, I've fallen into the trap of the industry. But then you then find some good people online. You you read around and you're like, okay, well there is a professional way, and then there is the social media way. And then I did end up on the right track. And from my academics background, I went so deep into it, studying it and go, you know, consuming as much as I could. Um, and yeah, eight years later, I'm now full time living in Dubai. I qualified in the end uh, a couple of years ago as a dentist, but then the moment I graduated, I was like, I'm done with this. My parents are happy. I've got that, you know, solidity, a backup plan, and yeah, moved out to Dubai for the for the tax free life. Came here for the taxes, stayed for the city. Beautiful opportunities here, amazing people here. And yeah, now, so these days I've got a couple of businesses. I've re-sparked my social media journey after two years off. Uh, and yeah, full-time trading. The evolution of my trading has been vast, where I've gone from indicator trading with Ichimoku Cloud and all of that, typical, typical retail, to then going to more of an EMA, because I thought that EMA, Fibonacci and trend lines, I thought that was more solid. And then you realize, okay, that's not usually enough. Then I went to kind of SMC, not quite ICT, but just generic SMC. And it was working at the time, six, seven years ago, ICT and oh, sorry, SMC was decent. And now when I see those same trades that I used to take, they're not working as they used to. And now I've kind of refined after years and years, my own approach, my own style. Uh, so even my trading journey has evolved a lot. <clears throat> it's not a case of I was a trader and then that's it. Um, and I do believe the industry has changed. The way to trade has to evolve. Um, and yeah, it's been most of all a fun journey uh, and I've enjoyed every moment. Well, wow, fantastic. And you're still trading, you know, every day these days, you you, you know, your trading week yeah. sort of starts on Monday and goes through to Friday. And Exactly. So let me let me give you a bit of context on exactly my routine or, or trading. So uh, maybe you haven't come across it, but I only recently started Twitter, maybe like two months ago. Uh, and I th I'm just because a couple of my friends, Riz and Omar, Omar Ashraf was a resident. For, uh, they were all like, okay, you got to get on Twitter. So, okay. I, I'd never even consumed Twitter content before. I was like, okay, if I come to Twitter, let me come with a bit of a bang and let me do something different. So I thought, you know, everyone's done the whole show my MT4 trades. Everyone's done the whole cherry picked hindsight. Look how good this trade was. Oh, I made $10,000, whatever. Everyone's done that. I thought, let me come in and call the market live ahead of time. And let me do that every day. So now that time we're filming is my ninth week on Twitter and my ninth week of calling public signals. And in fact, um, you know, the, they're getting a lot of views. Like just my tweet from yesterday, it got 100,000 views on a signal. My point being, I've challenged anyone publicly. If anyone can call me out and say how I'm manipulating it, you know, am I deleting tweets? I say, whenever I post something, have notifications on, take a screenshot. If anyone can show I've deleted a tweet or deleted a trade, call me out. And I don't, no one has because I have left every single trade there, wins and losses, and I'm calling it ahead of time. It's not like I take a screenshot and then post it when it's in profit. No, no, I'm saying I'm going to buy here. This is my entry. This is my stop loss. And then I update it. This is where you take profit. This is where we take full volume. This is your break even point. I've done it for nine weeks. I gave uh, 34 signals now and total tracked 40% profit in about two months. Again, all live ahead of time. And you can read through the comments. People are showing screenshots of taking the same trade. People are showing they just got funded. It's all there. And I thought, okay, that's something different. And um, I wanted to you know, make something out of it. So I, I recently restarted my YouTube channel. I've got a series on there breaking down all of those trades. So I'm then showing my um, logins to my account where you can see I've taken the trade. Not only do I have the MT4 on the live call out, then you can actually see on my end the execution and how much profit I made. So I thought that's something as transparent as I can be. And I don't think anyone's done that. And the reason I was doing that, because a lot of people are now post notifications on ready to take the signal. And that's not my intention. I don't want people to become, because I detest signals, because mm. what I just said of, I got roped into the industry through signals and the get rich quick. So I don't want to be now that ambassador, because I, I know I have a lot more to offer the industry. So I, the reason I'm doing it is, <clears throat> people have a lot of limiting beliefs of what is possible and what is not possible. Because you hear these sound bites on YouTube, on podcasts, and 
that's what we consume because there's no traditional formal education. So we take to the internet to learn. And the internet is the wild west where people are telling you, don't trade December, don't trade the M1, it's just noise, don't do this, don't do that. Some people are saying fundamentals is crap. Some people are saying technicals is crap. Some people are saying trading is 99% psychology, which doesn't make sense to me. But you know, when you hear all of this, you don't know where to begin. But then you kind of ascribe to your favorite mentor, you know, who looks the coolest, who looks, and usually your favorite mentor is linked to the most followers and the nicer car, not necessarily the most qualified or the most knowledgeable. But what I've realized is a lot of people are where I was five years ago, six years ago, where they have honest intentions, but they're getting a bit misguided. So instead of me now counting and saying, vouching, my strategy is the best and all of that, I say, no, every strategy works. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a strategy. It's just you got to look at the percentile of profitability. Meaning if you want to make 100K a year and you want to be a high school teacher, it's, the odds are not in your favor. But there will be, let's say, the principal, the headmaster, he might make a good salary. So if you want to make 100K a year and you choose teaching as your profession, you can do it, but majority won't. Like you want to be a typical head and shoulder trader, some will make it work, a very small percentile, but majority won't. But if I choose to be a lawyer or a doctor, okay, well now majority of doctors and lawyers can make 100K. Maybe some won't. So then it's like, okay, what route has my best odds? And that's what kind of my belief with strategies where every single one will work, or what is your percentile of, or the odds that it will work? And it's not necessarily down to the, the strategy down, because let's say I have a strategy that's based on swing trading, where I might have to hold a trade for two weeks. And I therefore I have to go through a period of 10 days of consolidation or a 60% reversal. So I might be up 4% and then it comes back to 1% and that's for weeks. Can you hold through that drawdown? Can mm -hmm. you hold through that retracement? There's a lot of factors that your strategy can be influenced with your psychology, but then it's not just about a strategy. Uh, so just through that process, I've built my system and my edge to optimize for more people can do it. And not only that, it kind of removes the elements of psychology. And we can touch upon why I've built a strategy in a certain way. But my belief is everything has to be with data. You can't just be like, oh, I saw this head and shoulder pattern work last week, so it works. Or, you know, I've seen people talk about Fibonacci and, and therefore it works. No, no, you need to show me a thousand trades. Whenever I've come and defended my way of trading, I've come with proof. I've shown on my YouTube channel a... 400 trade plus track record that is verified wins and losses. I show my win rates. I show my average risk reward, everything. And what you'll notice is my profit taking systems are fixed. I don't deviate away from it. People used to say, you know, take profit based on price action. For example, that's a, that's a very common thing that you hear. And therefore I did that. I thought, let me take a partial at a new lower low from a structural perspective. And again, that does make sense. When you have a winning trade, you can be like, oh, I got that one to 10 risk reward, one to 20 risk reward. Uh, and I just had to hold it for weeks. But when I got that final TP, I'm good. And, and it was a new lower low, which is market structure, perfect. What you realize is on a winning trade, you're happy. So when you post it on Instagram or someone posts it on Instagram, you're like, okay, this is strategy works. What you don't realize is how many times did it go 5% in your direction and reverse, 10% in your direction, maybe even 99% to your target and then reversed. It happens. But what I realized is when it comes to profit taking, it's a bell curve where you have your desired outcome and maybe 10% of your trades will go there. But then 10% of your trades will just go straight to stop loss. And the majority will be in the middle, part of the way to your 50% to your target and so forth. So I, I mapped mine and it had a bell curve. I was like, okay, instead of me trying to capitalize on each trade and trying to make the most profit on one trade, a trade by trade basis, I thought, no, no, that's not correct. I have a trading plan. I have a system. Let me optimize my profit taking for my data. So then I went ahead and looked at a thousand trade basis. And I saw optimal for me based on my data was take my first partial at a one to three risk reward and my full volume at a one to 10 risk reward. And then some trades might go beyond to one to 20 and one to 30. That's fine. That's not for me. That's not my trade. And on certain trades, it might look like an inefficiency of you left money on the table. You took a partial too early. But then I look at my bell curve and I'm like, okay, well, all of those trades that went to that one to five and I would have been holding for one to 10, but at one to five, I've already taken a partial now. So now I'm capitalizing on these smaller wins that uh, weren't you know aligned with my bias, and that's powerful. And the reason I say that is because there's I swear there's been weeks where I've been wrong in my directional bias. I thought the week was going to be bullish, ended up being bearish. I was wrong all week long, but I was able to get these small one to three risk rewards. One to three, uh, it's just yeah. taking a partial. So what I've realized, and again, my average stop loss is three to five or three to seven pips. So for me to get a one to three risk reward is 10, 15 pips. If you optimize for a London session trade with volatility, trading away from a manipulation, catching 10, 15 pips is not asking for the world. I trade EU and GU. 
And the average volatility on a London session is about 25 pips. 25 to 30 on GU and maybe 20 on EU. EU moves a little bit less. So I can be, if I can just know where the session is going, it doesn't matter where the day is going, doesn't matter where the week or the month is going, just the session. I know I can get my one to three risk reward and I can be wrong for the rest of the week. And this happened to me where I've entered a few times in a week. I've been wrong every time, but I've got my small partial. So I'll still be up three, four percent for the week and have been wrong all week. And that's powerful because then you're wrong, but you're not taking a mental hit. Your psychology is not affected. In fact, you're getting these small wins that compounds and also pays for your next loss. Then it's, you know, your psychology doesn't become an issue. Hey folks, what a view behind me. I'm at Blackpool Markets headquarters here in Auckland, New Zealand. Speaking of views, you can get TradingView paid plans for free at Blackpool Markets, saving you up to $600 a year. That's right, get either the Essential Plus or Premium plans absolutely free, and all you need to do is trade from one lot a month at Blackpool Markets. And you can also get a 100% deposit bonus for your first deposit up to $1,000. All you need to do is click the Trading Nut link in the description below. Um, but yeah, I, I'm off on a tangent, but I'm just very passionate no, it's, about my it's, system it's, because I've, I put it I put it on data, and I think that's the key for any trader. Yeah. When you have a belief, have your belief. That's fine, but test it and back it with data, and then optimize it for data. You should know your risk management backed by data, your profit taken backed by data, your trade models, your win rate should be backed by data. And something as simple as a win rate, I thought, and most people think a win rate is given to you based on how good you are as a trader. Your win rate is is given. Um, it's kind of like you're, when you're trying to, I don't know, bench press, just, just how much you've gone to the gym will be how big your bench press is. Not quite. Uh, it's, it's not something that is performance based. A win rate you can choose. For example, if I told a trader, say, you have to get an 80% win rate and they knew that they had to, then what would they do? They would trade like one trade a month and then find the perfect A plus setup, wait for all of their confluences. They might wait all month, but eventually when they find that golden setup, then they'll take the trade and the probability is in their favor. So you can have an 80% win rate strategy. You just have to be super selective and your trade frequency will be really, really low. But then you realize there's an inverse correlation between win rate and trade frequency. If you want to have um, a high win rate, low trade frequency. But then you realize if you're trading once a month and that month ended up being a loss, that 20% of the time it's a loss, or you wasted a month, you have to realize trade frequency has virtue. You need to have a balance between your win rate and your trade frequency because you want to play the risk reward game. Even if you're taking losses, your trade frequency is, let's say, one, two, three trades a week. You know that you'll take some losses, but the wins you take, if you have a three, four, five percent gain on your wins, playing a positive risk to reward, then trade frequency is more valuable than a super high win rate. So then what I've done is optimized it for data once again, and I found my sweet spot is my 45 to 55 percent win rate. I can have a 80 percent win rate. I can also have a 20 percent win rate and have a really tr high trade frequency. But I realized having a two, three trades a day and a low trade, a high trade frequency, low win rate is not the best way. So I've realized for me, my optimal is one or two trades a day max, so about 10, 10 trades a, a week, trading just two currency pairs, EU and GU. And I have two windows of opportunity a day that are strict. I have my London uh, window, which is about, is a one hour window. And then I give myself plus or minus 15 minutes. And then the New York window, plus or minus 15 minutes. So about two hours or two hours and a half, I can execute in a day. Those are my trading hours across two pr currency pairs. So two opportunities per day on two currency pairs. I have up to four shots a day. Obviously not all four will be valid setups because I'm I'm quite restricted in my confluences. So what you realize is my trade frequency can be reasonably high, so almost one a day. And you can see it on my signals, it's all on my feed. Almost one trade a day. My average win rate being 45 to 55%. And then my risk reward is fixed because my partial system is fixed. So I know a partial win for me is that one to three risk reward, 50% volume. A partial win for me is 1.5%. A full win for me is um, that extra 5%, one to 10 risk reward, 50% volume is 5%. 1.5% plus 5% becomes 6.5%. So a partial win for me is 1%. Sorry, a partial win for me is 1.5%. Yeah. A full win for me, a full win for me is 6.5%. And then a loss is minus one and a break even is zero. So then I know all of my outcomes. Either I lose 1%, I break even, I get 1.5% or 6.5%. Nothing more, nothing less. Fixed variables. My win rate is now fixed. My trade frequency is almost fixed. My risk management is also, well, I have models for it, but it's, it's fixed. What you realize is when you have a system like that and you've got your data behind it, what is the need for psychology? You know you have a system, it's proven and, and your trading strategy, which I can speak on, is optimized for your, for your mind. 
then you realize technicals is way more important than psychology. Or mm, let me phrase that better. Trading an edge is a foundation and then your psychology is on top. If you try and build a good psychology on a on a flawed system, a non-proven mm. system, you're trying to have affirmations and belief and you're trying to meditate and, and work on your emotions, work on your childhood traumas and your greed and your FOMO on a strategy that doesn't work. It's a waste of time. And in fact, it will give you more harm because you're trying to build faith into something that doesn't work. And that has a recurring effect. Rather, you build a strong technical edge, you have a system in place, and then you put psychology on top. And if you can optimize your technicals for psychology, then it's even better. So to summarize this point, um, my my systems are in a way where everything is fixed, but it's, it's maneuverable. Meaning if I'm in drawdown, that's a different situation to if I'm 10% up. If I'm up for the week, let's say I'm starting the week on a Monday and I'm neutral. Last week was a break-even week. That's a different framework than my last week I was up 10%. And now it's a Wednesday and this week I'm up 5%. I'm up 15% in the last you know, seven trading days. I can trade and be a little bit different to a period of drawdown. But then you need to know you have these bullets in your chambers and those bullets are your trade models and that should be modeled out. You shouldn't come to the market every day and think, today I'm seeing X, Y, Z, let me jump in a trade. That's a, that's a newbie trader. That's a newcomer to the industry. A professional trader has it all modeled out. It's a predefined plan and you have the data for all of your models. But then I have all of my trade types. I know all of my confluences. It's a checklist. Entry models, if I have all of my checklists, but I don't have one of my entry models, not my trade. When you have very strict criteria and you know each one of your trades has an associated win rate, then I know what to deploy. So let's say I'm going through a losing period and my equity curve is now down. And I also have seen my win rate of the last 20 trades is on the lower end of my buffer. Or let's say it's even you know 30%, not in my buffer of 45 to 55. I know I have to be on a conservative state. So I know that, okay, I have to retreat. I now fall back on only my prime setups, my A plus setups. And then I keep taking them. A couple of weeks pass, I will come back into profit. My trade frequency will be less, but I'll come back into profit. And my win rate, average win rate over the last 20 trades will go from, let's say 30%, it'll creep back up because I'm taking high probability trades. Now it might reach a point where I'm in profit. I, I My equity curve is good. And my my psychology is good because I've been on a on a good win streak, let's say. Now my trade frequency is low because I'm being super selective. And my average win rate now comes a bit too high for my preferred range. Now, let's say my win rate is 60%, 65%. I'm like, okay, now I'm good. I'm in a better situation. Now I can opt in for trade frequency. I can now let loose a little bit. I can now take more trades and I can go to those other trade models that I have that are counter trend, their hedge positions, their re-entry positions that are not the most profitable. Maybe they have a 50% win rate, 40% win rate, but I know it has a positive risk reward. And now instead of flying my win rate to 80%, I can bring it back down to my range, controlled buffer, and now increase my uh, trade frequency. What you realize is as a trader, you have your controlled variables and your uncontrolled. Your uncontrolled is the market. And the problem is I and most traders, you try and control the uncontrollable. I want the market to do this. I feel like it needs to do this. And if you're trying to control something that doesn't, you can't control, it's going to drive your psychology insane. And there's no other way about it. But if you realize... Everything is out of my control. The market will do what it can, whatever it wants to do, but I have these things I can control. I maximize my controllables. The way I like to give the analogy is, you know those people that spin plates? You got to spin each plate and this one's about to fall, quickly spin that, and then this one and spin it. That's what trading is. You have your controllable variables and you got to give attention to each one of them. And you're just spinning them and finding the balance. So the, the ones that I've got is my win rate is floating and I've got to optimize it. I've got to spin that plate when it's relevant. My trade frequency, I was going low. My win rate is okay. Okay, let me spin that plate. Let me get my trade frequency up. You're doing this delicate dance, but it all lies upon you have to have a proven edge and data and models. If you're trying to do this you know, this whole dance and you're trying to come to the market and you don't even have a predefined plan, that's where traders go wrong. That's why I went wrong for a long time. So it starts off in the backtesting and, and it starts off in the creation process. Once you've curated a strategy, backtesting doesn't serve a purpose. Now it becomes stress testing, tracking your performance and journaling. You got to know where you are in your career and then you need to know what to address. If you're trying to address your psychology, but you don't have an edge, start off with the edge. Someone like me now who has an edge, proven, I'm, I've shown profitability, I've done it for years. Now I can work on my psychology because it's more relevant. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a long <laughs> tangent, but kind of summary on me. <laughs> I didn't want to stop you because there's so much in there that I think, I mean, I'm learning from and I, I know that people listening are learning from. I mean, what, what what it seems like is key and where I suppose either a lot of people listening have either got to this point here in their 
trading career uh, where they haven't done the work and they haven't got the edge mm-hmm. or somebody who's new and thinking, what the hell? I don't want to have to go through all this pain and, and suffering to get this edge, to find this edge. Can you tell mm-hmm. us like how you managed to do it? I mean, what were the sort of steps you took and what was the sort of level that you gave yourself mm-hmm. as to like, this was going to be an acceptable uh, level of data that would give me enough confidence that I have an edge that I can now apply and, and move forward and, and trade with confidence. Yeah. So to answer that question, it's a non, it's a, it's an answer that maybe doesn't seem too correlated, but I'll link it back at the end. So bear with me. It's important to have a correct life setup. And now what I mean is trading is a great vehicle for wealth, but it's not the best vehicle and forget best or worst vehicle. It's a relevant vehicle depending on where you are in your in your career to wealth. Now, let's say I'm dead broke. I'm in debt. Trading is not my vehicle. It's not my path. I need financial stability first. I need to get a job. I need to have at least 5, 10K in the bank. Then trading can be my vehicle. If I want to be worth 100 mil, trading is no longer my vehicle. There's better vehicles for that. So let's speak upon your vehicles to success of wealth. And let's say you're starting from broke. Now, I, someone as a student, I didn't have financial burdens. My my family and everything was taken care of me. So rent was paid for, my tuition was paid for until my final years where I took care of it myself. But in that sense, I didn't have any financial burdens. I didn't need to do a job because everything was covered. So I had time. Obviously, I had my university commitments, but I had time. I had no financial burdens. I had no kids. I had no rent, mortgage. Uh, I didn't have to work two jobs. So I'm in a different situation to someone who's a little bit older, who's now got kids. He can't take the same risks in his life because he's older. Uh, he's got a mortgage to pay. Maybe he's working two jobs. He's working weekends. That is a completely different setup. So not all traders are equal in that sense. You need to know where you are. So what I always say is if you want, if you haven't made your first 10K yet, if you haven't made 10K a month yet, don't pick trading. It's not your best vehicle. What I say is if, if you want to get from zero to 10K a month around there, or you know 50K net worth, there's other opportunities. What I usually recommend if you don't have a skill or let's say a qualification like a dentist, in my case, I would have just done my job and, and you know, I would have earned ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month as a dentist. I do that for a couple of years, I have a cash buffer. So then I can start a trading journey or a risky endeavor. But not everyone's in that situation, obviously. So what I recommend is get into a high income skill that is based on commission and performance. Something like a sales job where the learning curve is not too steep in sales, but you get paid on performance and you do high ticket sales, you get a 10% commission. You're selling a product for $5,000. Each close gives you $500. You're doing calls all day or five hours of calls a day. You can make $5,000 a month. Uh, And in some of my business, I have a sale team and I pay people $5,000, $10,000 a month on commission. That is not a strong learning curve. It's not a huge time commitment. And after you've done your calls, you can switch off, meaning you can focus on other things. That is a good vehicle to get to, let's say 10K, 20K net worth. Another thing would be B2B service delivery. If you learn Facebook ads or you learn email marketing, which is not a huge learning curve, there are companies out there that don't have a clue about these things that will pay you $2,000 a month to take care of all of it for you. So then you can have five clients paying $2,000 a month. You get 10K. And if you want to free up your time, you go on Fiverr, you go on Upwork, you get a media buyer, you get an admin guy, you get a PA or a VA, let's say, and you pay these guys you know, in their country a good salary. But you know, if you're getting Western clients and you're paying Eastern salaries, that arbitrage, it's called contract to arbitrage. You can pocket three, four thousand dollars a month without having to push too much time. You just manage the team and do sales calls to get clients. Now you've got a bit of money coming in and you've got time back and you haven't got huge commitments. So now you're in a better situation to take a risky endeavor like trading. But what I'd say is start off with B2B service delivery or sales um, to get a bit of cash. And what the priority in that period is not necessarily building a career because sales will not get to get you to a $10 million net worth. It can get you to 100K net worth, but then you're pinned by your time. You have no time freedom, but you can get cash, you can get stability, and it's a skill you can fall back on. You start off there. Once you've got 10K in the bank, now you need to buy back your time. So now you need to do this contract arbitrage, hire a couple of people. So your monthly income comes a little bit less, but you have a cash buffer. I think having 10K is appropriate and having time is more is more needed. The reason I say 10K is because instead of trying to fund an account with your own money and scale it that way, it's very, very hard. It's not worth it with prop firms that exist. Secondarily, you need to de- you need to have a budget to deploy to education. This whole notion of learn while you earn, it's ridiculous. And, and you can do it, people, people do it, but it's, people think it's the fast way. Let me make money whilst I'm earning. They, they say slow is smooth, 
and smooth is fast. Meaning the real get rich quick scheme, the real fast way is slow, slow, consistent gains over time. Com you know, that one, what's that law called? One degree of separation. If a boat sails north and another boat, boat sails north, one degree, in a hundred kilometers, they're, they're miles and miles mm. apart. Just one, one percent difference, one degree difference. And that applies to trading. That is the fast way. So what I've said then is if you have 10K in the bank, ready to deploy in your, uh, in your trading career and you've bought back your time, meaning you've got a bit of cash to, you know, so you don't have to work two jobs or you pay off your debt, whatever it may be, just so you have time to focus on education. Have 5K budget to deploy on mentors, deploy on education. And again, it might seem like, oh, I don't need a mentor. I don't need it. Sure. But in my own experience, I've spent two, three, four hundred thousand dollars on education, not just in trading, but in mentorship, business consulting, and all of these things. And in my podcast, Titans of Tomorrow, I've had so many guests that have a $10 million net worth, a $20 million net worth. They all say the same thing. You need mentors. You need someone because what is success if you were to do it as a formula? It's hard work multiplied by good education, multiplied by mentor brackets, multiplied by time. Time is a key factor. But you can do all of that. But if you don't put in time, you're not going to get the same output. If you don't put in hard work, you're not going to get the same output. If you don't put in good education, you're gonna, not going to get the output. If you don't put in good mentors, it's going to take you a lot longer because those mentors will teach you. They'll, they'll shorten your learning curve. They'll show you their mistakes. And a mentor is not what the industry says of somebody who's going to sell you a course. It's not a mentor. That's, that's videos. And you can find videos online. Mentorship, truly mentorship, is someone that can almost hold your hand and show you where you're going wrong. You know, they, they'll look at your equity curve and say, here's your mistakes. They'll look at your losing trades and say, good job. Those losing trades were good trades to take. Or they'll look at your winning trades where you're in profit and say, hey man, I know that was a winning trade, but that was a bad trade. Don't do that again. Because over time, that will be hmm. leading to further losses. That's what a mentor will do. And, and that is worth, it's going to be expensive. You know, these people that are doing well, that are living the life you want to live, they don't care about $100. And, and what I say is, if you judge a mentor on how they live and what they do, if somebody is a mentor, this million dollar trade or whatever, but he's charging $100 and he's spending five hours a day on Zoom calls, his priority is his education. His income is his, is his education. If you see a mentor who's living a great life and he charges super high, but he only has five students, that's a real mentor. He only has you know, a small cohort of people and he works closely with them, gives them their time, but he's strict with their time, maybe two hours a week. That is a real mentor because he's focused on trading and you've got to show that credibility. Once you have a mentor, your learning curve will be better. So you have to have money to deploy to that. And then the remaining 5K budget of this 10K buffer should probably go to prop firm challenges. What I find is if people go to prop firms and they buy one account and they need that account to be the one that is their golden account, that they're going to have their whole payouts all their whole career on one account. Sure, you can do that because that's what you're taught. You know, good risk management, one strategy, one account, slow building an equity curve. But again, we have a wonderful opportunity in front of it, which, which is prop firms. So why not play to the system? Meaning... If you lose an account, if you blow an account, not your money. Your max loss is $300 that you paid for it. So if you can be in a situation where you have $5,000 to deploy into prop firms, you can pay for, let's say, I don't know, 20, 30 challenges. You can blow 15 of them and it doesn't matter because when you do finally get two or three funded accounts, you have $500,000 in max allocation or you know assets under management. You just need to pull one or 2% gain per month and not only have you paid back all of your investment into education, all of your investment into failed prop firm accounts, you've actually put money into your pocket and you can make a small living out of it. Meaning trading is not a game of how good of a trader you are, how profitable you can be. It's a game of capital. Meaning if you can pull one or 2% profit per month on a slow, small risk, but you have large capital, that's the game. It's not about getting 50% return, 100% return on a small account, which is why people get deviated because they're like, oh, I need to make crazy gains to make money because they don't have enough capital. So then you chase the holy grail. You chase the crazy strategy. You chase the flashy stuff, and that's where you lose track. But if you realize my objective is just 2% a month, super achievable. When you have large capital, you can make a great living from it. And what I say is that's a great wealth vehicle for $1 million to $10 million. If you want to get into that region, trading is your best bet. If you want to get to 100K net worth, I would say sales, B2B, service delivery, tangible business. You want to get to um, $1 million to $10 million, trading is great. But then there's diminishing returns. After that, from $10 million to $30 million, I'd say a cash flow business. That is the best route because then you can leverage other people's time. There's nothing as solid as a tangible business that is cash flow optimized. 
But that will be diminishing returns. There's only so much products you can sell. There's only so much service you can fulfill. And you will get diminishing returns on marketing, on sales and all of that. So then if you want to go from $30 million to $100 million, no longer is your best vehicle a cash flow business. Now your best vehicle is going for a cash exit, you know, building a software and going for a valuation and having a company for cash flow and having a company for uh, revenue and a multiplier and valuation, two different things. This one is optimized for profit. This one is optimized for valuation. And that one will get you to a hundred million dollar net worth. And I have a few people in my circle doing that right now. So it's kind of knowing where you are in your journey and where to start. If, if I, as a beginner at university, try to do a SaaS software company for a valuation and a cash exit to try and go for that hundred million dollar net worth, I would never work. I don't have the experience. I don't have the financial backing. I don't have the contacts. That's the last vehicle. So you got to know where you are in your journey and pick your vehicle accordingly and then ascend. But if I now start to, uh, as a trader and I want to get to a hundred million dollar net worth as a trader, you can, but it's so hard. So it's just like that analogy I gave. There are teachers out there, high school teachers that are earning hundred K. There's not many of them, but there are doctors who are earning hundred K. So then as just in the career path, your vehicle is important. If you want to make hundred K a year, your best odd is a doctor or a lawyer. Your best odds are not a high school teacher, even though some teachers do make it. So if I want to have a hundred million dollar net worth, my best vehicle is not trading. If I want to have a $5 million net worth, trading is my best vehicle. There's no knowing where you are and then you optimize each stage of your journey. And that's kind of the, the roadmap I have for myself. And I'm along that journey. And I've always said, trading is a good skill set. I have it and I've been, and it's been good for me. And I won't be doing this forever. And I don't want to be doing it forever because my goal is success. And what is success as a definition? It's a few things. Obviously, it's different for everyone. But if I'm to summarize it, it's time freedom, financial freedom, and location freedom. Trading gives me two. It gives me uh, financial freedom to an extent or good extent. And it gives me a geographical freedom. I can trade from everywhere. I, I travel four or five countries a year. I live in Dubai. You know, it's, it's giving me those two things, but I do not have time freedom, especially in the way I trade. And then traders will think, okay, if I want my time freedom, let me just trade higher time frame swing. That will have an effect on your profitability. So instead of trying to optimize the time freedom in your trading, no, just know you're in a stage of your life where you don't have time freedom. Double down, find a good strategy, get cash, and then move on to the next vehicle that will give you time freedom. So then you'll have financial, geographical, and time. So that's what I'm on right now, where I know I don't have the most time freedom, and I'm okay with that. Young, I'm a bachelor, I don't have any commitments. Why not hustle? Why not spend all my day working and having multiple projects at once, which is why I randomly launch a podcast, which is why I randomly have multiple businesses and trade, because I have time. But later on in my career, when I'm 40, 50, and I have kids, I'm going to value time freedom more than I do now. I don't need time freedom right now, but later on in my life, I will. I might have kids and so forth. So then I need to know I need a vehicle that is going to optimize for time. It won't be trading because trading is not a time freedom vehicle. It's a cash generating method that gives you geographical freedom and, and financial freedom. So I optimize for now. And then I know I've putting in, I'm, I'm put it, planting the seeds now for those later vehicles in life. Um, but let, let's say some of the viewers are at university and they're dead broke pick a better vehicle, or let's say you have three jobs and you don't have any time to study, or the learning curve of trading is so high. And this notion of learning and earning, delete that from your mind. Just be in a situation where you have a bit of cash savings. You have about 10K in the bank to deploy, and then give yourself a year where you don't need to make any profit and have savings so you can pay your bills and all of that. But give yourself a year where you have time to learn. You still have a job, but you have the weekends and evenings. Once you have that one year to learn, trading a demo account, consuming good content, having a good mentor, testing a strategy, and then going to, to the profit from route. That is the slow route. That is the fast route. Slow is fast. But that route of trying to do prop firms as you learn, yeah, you might think, oh, I might accidentally get a payout. You might, mm. but you, the odds are not in your favor. But rather, skip that whole, try to get a huge bull run on a, on a prop firm account, learn, then earn, and then know your, your right vehicle. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm along the way on my journey for that. And that's kind of how I'll see my career moving forward as well. So, so I'd, I'd still want to touch back on to like getting that edge. So you, you, you know, you said you were going to sort of mm -hmm. roll around to, I don't know if we quite got there, but yeah. so, so what, so what about like numbers, like time, you obviously did it at university, you know, whereas here now you're sort of recommending don't do it at university, go and get yourself a financial yep. buffer before you go into it. Yep. I mean, can you sort of talk through that? So like, when you're going into the nitty gritty of like, right, I'm going to find the strategy. I'm going to back test it. I'm going to get X number of trades before I go, right, I'm confident in this. Hmm. Yeah. So my situation was kind of unique because I was a university student. So I didn't need the financial relief because 
my family, my father was helping me with that. So I was in a lucky position. I know my blessings and not everyone is in that state, but I can speak on my experiences. Having that financial relief helped so much because I was not desperate to make money. And I've seen traders who are desperate to make money and they get it all wrong because they're stressed. And especially if they've spent a bit of money on a mentorship and they didn't even, couldn't even afford that money. Oh, now they're really desperate to make profit. It's not a good setup. So once you have the good setup, then you have time to learn in an isolated bubble. And that's what I was. I was a university student. I had no financial pressures. I could just learn. And fortunately, because I had no money, I couldn't also deposit money into a brokerage. I, I just didn't have $100,000 to throw. And prop firms weren't really a thing. And I was actually the first, one of the first people to get into the prop firm space back in 2000 and what was it? 2015, 16. That's when, you know, FTMO was just creeping up or whatever. But in my real time, when I first started off, prop firms were not a thing. So I couldn't deposit money into an account. Prop firms didn't exist. So what do I do? Or well, demo account it is, which is a coincidence or a confluence of events, but it worked out so well because I wasn't learning and earning. I was just learning. And even if I wanted to flip an account or blow an account, I had no account to blow. I didn't have the money. So now in hindsight, I look at that and think that was great. Because if I had money, I would have blown it. If I had prop firms, I would have spent 10K on prop firms and, and blown that money too. Having that one and a half year period of just learning in isolation on a demo account served me really well, which is why I'm an advocate of that process. It's not a case of I did something and I'm saying do something else. It's actually what I learned. And in hindsight, I, I can say this was the best way. But the nitty gritty of it. So I went through the whole industry, kind of every method, every strategy you can imagine. I've studied it. And from my academic background, you can imagine I didn't just touch upon it. I went deep into Elliott Wave Theory. I went deep into SMC. I went deep into uh, Wickoff Theory, everything. So with, through that process, you trial and test. You see this works, this doesn't work, and so forth. And it's just years and years of refinement. And and I live what I say, meaning for the last three years uh, in my training career, where I'm doing well now, I haven't missed a single M1 candle, one minute time frame candle on EURUSD or GBP USD during a London Open or a New York Open. My two windows that I trade I haven't missed a candle in probably two, two and a half years. Now, if there's a trader out there who's learning and he's not doing the same, why not? Like you, 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 there's one thing which is learning and studying, which somebody can help you with. A mentor can help you with, a course can help you with, and that's needed. But then there's another thing called doing the reps, meaning someone can teach you about a good diet. Someone can teach you how to have good form on a bench press, but then you got to go and do the reps yourself in the end. No one can eat that meal for you. No one can do the workout for you. The same applies to the market. You can learn, you can, you can have a course, you can have a mentor, but in the end, you've got to do your own reps. And what are trading reps? Trading reps are market experience, market IQ. You've got to watch the market every day because that time, even if you're taking no trades, but just watching price action, you will learn subconsciously or consciously, you will learn over time. And I've had my biggest breakthroughs in those years where I've just been watching price action, taking trades, taking losses, making mistakes, now, majority of my strategy, majority of my edge, majority of my way of thinking is not from the courses I did, and I did a lot. It's not from all the videos I watched, and I watched a lot. It was from those years where I was watching price action deeply. Because you you learn, you make mistakes, you refine. Just watching a price action for one week and taking no trade, watching yourself like, oh, I feel like jumping in a trade. I, I'm feeling on edge. I, I'm feeling, I want to eager. You're learning about your mind. You're learning about how you think. If you haven't gone through that period for week, you know, process for weeks on end, watching price action and monitoring your emotions. You have no idea your psychology. You no idea. You have no idea of your temperament, your, your way of your, your emotionality. You have no, you're not in tune with it. But just watching price action will make you in tune. If you have a theory of, I want to take trades based on X, Y, Z, and then you come to the market and you watch it. You say, oh, my backtesting showed it's profitable. And then you go to the live market and you're like, oh, I take a loss, another loss, another loss. And you realize, oh, in my backtesting it was working, but in the live market it wasn't working. And I've been there. You think, okay, well, what, why? You know, I have proven strategy in my back testing, but in the live market, it doesn't work. There's a bridge there. And there's so many traders have been in that gap. We're like, it doesn't make sense. So what did they do? The value of despair, let me strategy jump. Oh, this must work. No, it must not work. They go to another strategy and they bounce and they bounce and they bounce. Well, you realize that gap can be closed. And that gap between your back testing and your strategy and performance and execution, that gap is your market experience and market IQ. You can close that gap but it's not accidental. You have to do the reps. You have to do the time. And to give you a bit more tangible, uh, some, some meat on the bones of what I actually did, I realized that there is correlation and there's causation. Uh, just for an analogy's sake, um, let's say I, li I, li I live on the beach. So I can see, and, and there's ice cream stalls and stuff. You can see that, okay, when it's summer months, when it's hot months, when it's good weather, people are outside. 
and they're buying ice creams. But good weather means ice cream sales go up. But good weather also means people want to go and do water sports. They want to jet ski. They want to do all these crazy adrenaline activities. So maybe uh, water sports accidents go up. So you realize when the good weather comes out, ice cream sales up, water sports accidents up. But does ice cream cause water sport accidents? No, it was the good weather. Meaning to say certain strategies are correlation. The market does not move because of X, Y, Z. So you're finding a correlation. So you can see, you can notice a pattern say, oh, this head and shoulder pattern happened and price reverses after that head and shoulder pattern. You found a correlation. Price is correlating to that. Ice cream sales are up, water sport accidents are up. Ice cream does not cause deaths in water sports. You just found a correlation. But what is a causation? Meaning if I, if I take a lighter and I put it on some gas, it's going to cause a fire. That's a causation, direct link. But then you have to find what are the causations in the market? So when I started to look into that, what causes price to reverse? What moves price? That is so much more important than a strategy. And when I kind of removed that from my paradigm of I need to find a strategy based on correlations, based on data, based on probability, which is what we're all taught, then you think, okay, well, I need to find the primary drivers, the first principles, what really moves the market. When you're on that line of thinking, it becomes a lot easier. And I can speak on that. What is a Fibonacci? Well, a Fibonacci is a probabilistic zones of reversal. And what you realize is if you were to take 100 impulses and retracements and you were to plot them on a graph, you'll realize some retracements go 10% retracement and continue. Some retracements go 99% and then continue. But just like before I said, it becomes a bell curve. Some retracements are deep, some retracements are shallow, majority are in the middle. What you realize is those majority in the middle happen to align with Fib levels. So price is not moving because of a Fibonacci. Price is reversing mm -hmm. And Fibonacci is a reflection of that. It's a probabilistic scenario. Same for a trend line. One touch, two touch, odds are a touch will happen. It's not reversing because of a trend line. Trend line represents that. Re it's a correlation. Same for a support level. Historic support, support, support. It might support again, but it's not going to reverse because of that support level. These are all correlated factors. An EMA, a lagging indicator. Price is not reversing because of your RSI. Price is not reversing because of a head and shoulder pattern. Price is reversing and the RSI shows it. Price is reversing and the head and shoulder pattern shows a correlation. The way you realize is I, I, when I moved away from all of that, that's when I started to do SMC. I was like, oh, SMC looks better. You know, it's kind of like a cult. It was kind of the new buzzword. I was like, okay, let me jump into this. And it was better. No doubt it was better. Gave me better precision, gave me better entries, gave me a better restored, gave me a better win rate. But what I was doing before, this was a better solution. And it got, got me to a profitable stage. But I'm talking six years ago and the market has evolved since because SMC has gone from a niche cult that no one knew about to every pyramid scheme and every YouTube channel knowing and talking about SMC. SMC has now become retail and I can vouch for it because I've seen it. I have screenshots on my phone going back six years where I'm taking a trade based on a certain confluence set. If I take that same trade today, I guarantee it will not work because now in my strategy, I trade against SMC. I have a concept called smart money traps and I made a YouTube video on it not too long ago where, and I put a tweet on it, which went semi-viral, which I said, look, SMC traders, I can show you smart money, smart money concepts doesn't work. And I'm not just saying this because I feel like it. I'm going to bring you proof. This was like after six weeks, I was, I was giving signals. So I had a catalog of proof of all of these trades I've taken. It was about 20 trades. And I had screenshots. So each one of those trades had a smart money concepts trap in it. I was trading using smart money traps against SMC. So then I've not just come onto Twitter and say, SMC doesn't work. I've said, SMC doesn't work. Here's a catalog of evidence. Now, if you want to come and say SMC does work, show me your catalog of evidence. Because then it comes a meaningful debate. It's not hearsay. It's not theory. It's not, it's not feelings and opinions. It's proof. I've had my catalog of proof and I've shown it. I'm not like anti-SMC for the sake of it because it's a buzzword or clickbait. I was pro-SMC when it worked for me, when it no longer worked for me and no longer served me. And in fact, I trade against it. Now I vouch for that. So I'm vouching for what works. I'm not vouching for a particular agenda. Um, so yeah, then I evolved away from SMC when I, I saw it didn't, wasn't working so well. And then I went to first principles. So that's kind of the conclusion of where I want to bring it to. You have to come to first principles and primary drivers. What are they? Price has correlated factors, which I've spoken about, and then it has causative factors. So what is driving price? What is truly moving the market? I believe it's liquidity. Liquidity is the fuel of the market. Liquidity is the oxygen. Right? If, if, if there's no liquidity, price has no reason to move. Well, who's buying it and who's selling it? You have to realize volatility comes from liquidity. Manipulations is liquidity. 
orders are liquidity. So that's what the market, that's the only essence of the market. So if you realize you have a zone of consolidation, a range, and then price breaks out, what is it doing? By nature, above that range, there's going to be stop losses. It's a definite. It doesn't matter who stop losses it, whether it's a retail trader, whether it's algo, whether it's a bank, it doesn't matter. There are guaranteed to be stop losses above a resistance level. If price shoots up, grabs those orders, and maybe even you know breakout traders, they're going to enter. They see breakout, test, continuation. They're putting stop loss. So just that spike up and down grabs out the early sellers, seller stop loss, and the breakout traders who are buying too early takes them out too. That kind of manipulation is what moves the market. The market goes from wiping out uh, traders and enticing traders to enter, thinking something that is not happening. So the market will feed into every strategy. It will show you breakout traders work. It will show you trend line traders work because if it didn't work and no one believed in it, they wouldn't offer up their liquidity. So at times it works, but over time it can't work. Otherwise the market is not going to work as a model. Market is zero sum, winners to losers. There's no money created or destroyed. I mean, we can talk about fiat and, and the central banks and all of that, but in general, you can think of Forex or the currency market as a closed loop. So if money is not created or destroyed, it moves from participants. Liquidity becomes the only essence. You have to trick people to get in. You have to wipe them out to move that money from winners to losers. So that became a private driver and, and I looked into that. So then I optimized my strategy for liquidity. Where can I see price is going to manipulate people? Where, is, where am I going to see is the most area where people are going to get confused? Well, I looked into that. And what you realize is there's a concept called time-based manipulations. The, there'll be manipulations all day long. And it's a subjective thing. And I can say this is a manipulation. You can say that is a manipulation based on what you see the market as. So what you have to realize is the market, especially on the M1 timeframe, I've shown this so many times, every every 10 minutes, there will be a small manipulation, whether that's manipulation of an Asia session, whether that's a manipulation of previous days high, whether that's manipulation of a small trend line that was building. There's manipulations all day long. So you can't just be chasing every run of liquidity, chasing, every, no, no, that's chaos as well. You take so many losses, especially on the M1. So what you have to realize is your best bet is finding the inducement of the day. Inducement meaning run of liquidity. If you can find the main run of liquidity of the day, let's say I find the main run of liquidity going up and I sell with it, then I've, then I've got the main move of the day and I optimize for that. And if I know that I'm trading my London session key window, which is the most volatile moment of a London session, trading away from a main run of liquidity of the day. Now I've got two powerful things. I've got volatility and, li and liquidity. And then I don't need to know where the rest of the week is going to go. I just need to know where, what was the purpose of that run of liquidity and what is the next liquidity pool it will target. I'm going from liquidity pool to liquidity pool. And that's what the market does. It, hunt, it seeks liquidity, hunts it, takes it, uses that fuel, and it runs out of fuel because when price comes lower, it's cheaper, buyers get in, sellers take profit, and now it's a new market condition, it will eventually taper off. So now what does it need? It needs more liquidity, it needs more fuel. You run out of gas, then it'll build up orders again. It'll build up a trap again, manipulate, grab liquidity and go again. That's how the market moves and operates from liquidity pool to liquidity pool. So then I was like, okay, let me learn more about liquidity pools. So what are they? So there are strong liquidity pools and weak liquidity pools. And this is not a theory. This is just use common sense. Where are the most people going to place their stop losses? On a daily, on a daily higher high structure, daily structure, many, many stop losses. On a M1 double top, small liquidity, but still liquidity. So you got to find all your liquidity types and make a checklist. These are the best ones. These are the worst ones, but they're all liquidity. Then you got to build scenarios around it. What happens if I have an age high liquidity and a previous day's high liquidity? Okay. Then you have a protocol. If I have age high liquidity, previous day's high liquidity, previous week's high liquidity, and a daily structure point and a smart money trap, way more liquidity. You can anticipate a way better move or a way stronger move. So when you then start to really like, okay, I'm building my models around liquidity and then I'm putting checklists on what is good liquidity and bad liquidity and I can start to make a thesis around that. And that's what I've done. So I find the main inducement of the day. I I don't know when is enough liquidity. The market will tell me. So then I need to have models that show me when the market has got enough liquidity. I can't just be setting limits and jumping into trades because that will lead to a lot of losses. So then you have to have models that show you reversal. M1 reveals that, which is why I'm such a proponent because you have a higher time frame supply zone. Everybody knows what that is. How do you know when it's going to respect and fail? Because there will be times of respects and at times when it fails. The only way to read it is the one minute time frame. You'll see if it's respecting or if you see it's going to violate it. The M1 will reveal everything. So for example, when you have a run of liquidity, I need to know when is enough liquidity. M1 will show me that. And then I take a trade based away from that inducement of the day, the run of liquidity, 
optimize for a London session volatility, and then I just target the next liquidity pool. And now what you realize is, because I'm trading the M1 time frame, my average stop loss is three to seven pips. So I can very quickly hit stop loss or very quickly break even. Within five minutes, it will tap my entry and hit my stop loss or break even within five to 10 minutes. And my signals have shown that. And that's fine because I don't need to sit and draw down and hope and chase whatever. I just know right away if I'm right or wrong. If I'm right, I break even very aggressively because I know my trade frequency is often. If it goes to my final TP, but it hit my break even first and I miss the trade, oh well, I go again tomorrow. I can break even very aggressively, meaning I mitigate risk so quick that I break even more often than I take losses. And that's how it should be. You, you have a thesis, you have a reason to take a trade. The moment it's gone in your direction, you can break even, put it. And then if it hits you out, break even, that's fine. Go again tomorrow. Because you know that when you do find that good trade, and it will come when you do find that good trade, it will go from your entry to take profit with that session volatility. You have that strong move within one or two hours, it will go to your TP. It will do that 20, 30 pip move. That is the all I need for a one to 10 risk reward. And then my final TP is that. So I'm out, I'm done. So when I've shown on my Twitter, all of the trades, those trades where I'm consolidating and messing around, I don't want to take those trades. Then that doesn't have enough liquidity. But when I've taken a signal and I've given ahead of time and I said, look, we've taken a lot of liquidity right now. We're coming into a key time window and we're seeing good lower time frame reversal models. I should give the signal because I'm confident. I have my data. I'm not even scared to be in front of 20,000, 50,000 traders and give a signal. I'm not scared because I have my data. And, I'm, and when I take that trade, I know it's either going to hit my stop loss within five minutes. Risk management is there for that. Oh, well. Or within the session, I'm going to do that one to 10 risk reward profit. And I've done so many times publicly now that it shouldn't even be in question that does this exist or not. The, the timestamps are there. And I think it's the best trading model because when I bring it back to psychology, I'm hitting my stop loss right away. No need for psychology. I'm hitting break even right away. So I'm at peace. My, my money is not at risk. And then if I can hit take profit within two hours and my first one to three risk reward, by the way, my first take profit, that's after 10, 15 pips because I have a three to seven pip stop loss. So let's say a five pip stop loss, one to three risk reward is 15 pips. 15 pips on a London session after a run of liquidity, it's, it's very often. If I don't hit stop loss, I will hit that TP. I very rarely just hit break even nothing. It'll be stop loss or one to three and then break even. And then I can always get this compounding win, which is why my signals are going so well. Out of my signals, maybe only five, six trades have hit that full TP. But the majority of that 40% profit has been that one to three, one to three, one to three, one compounds, compounds, it adds up. So then I can be wrong, but still show public profit it's in the signals. When you realize you have a system that is going to be profitable, even when you're wrong, you realize it doesn't matter how good of a trader I am. It doesn't matter about a holy grail. It doesn't matter about how smart you are. There's one thing called an analyst, which is I can call the market. And there's another thing called a trader. I can trade my ideas, which I called. Being a trader is different to being an analyst. And to be a trader, you need to have these systems in place that removes elements of psychology and is optimized for profit taking. And my, an my analysis might show me price is going to be a swing trade for the next two weeks but I'm still going to be my trader mind and take that profit at that one to 10 because I know that's my data. So that's kind of how I've optimized everything. And now I know that I might be taking a swing trade that I missed out on. That's okay because I've taken my partials that are optimized for my data. And all I need to not, all I need to know is where is the session going to go? And when you have a volatile moment and a, you correctly identify manipulation, it's, it's a lot easier to know where the session is going to go. And usually that session volatility doesn't always align with structure doesn't always align with the common things we're taught. So that's where a lot of people take losses. And it happens in my comments all the time. They'll see I'm buying. They'll be like, well, Car, but structure is bearish and you're going bullish. I'm like, yeah, I'm only going bullish for the session. It might be bearish for the rest of the day and the week. You might be right, but I'm not, I'm going to be out by then anyway. I just want to get this 30 pip move, the session volatility. Uh, so that's kind of how I've evolved over the last three, four years. And it's just been deep in the trenches, watching price action, coming up with ideas and refining and refining and refining. I've got a few questions here on um uh that first of all like you know so obviously you you had to get that edge again after you realize you know I'm moving away from smart money concepts I'm not going to trade against them how many trades did you take just give us a number um before you, or sorry back test before you were like confident okay I'm going to now trade this way in my eight years I've back tested thousands of trades and I I'll show you when we do a technical breakdown I have a folder on my laptop because I used to screenshot everything. I didn't have a journal platform like Tradezilla. I had my own uh, laptop. So I can just scroll and the folder is so big, it'll take like 10 minutes to load. But I have every screenshot of every trade I've taken and every screenshot of every trade I've back tested. Wow. It's a huge folder. And that folder has, I don't even know, but it has 
more than 10,000 screenshots, thousands, thousands. Meaning to say, I didn't just become profitable in one month, six months. It was time and time. And I have the screenshots there to prove it. And a lot of the screenshots you'll see, I was on a Zoom call with my with my boys, the other guys in WWA, Ukarwali Alex. You see on the Zoom, uh, it's a screenshot on a Zoom call. You see our pictures on the Zoom meeting. You see it's a live Zoom call and we're taking trades. We're drawing our analysis. We're taking screenshots, archiving it. Thousands and thousands of trades of backtesting and trades taken. Thousands. I've taken thousands of trades. I've blown accounts. I've lost money, of course. I've, I've been through periods of losing. I've done it all. But this is an industry where there's so much to learn. Yeah. Look, the reason people get trapped into this industry is there's a very strong dichotomy that doesn't exist in any other industry where you have an infinitely low barrier to entry. Uh, what does it cost to get a start as a trader? MT4 sign up free. Broker deposit, $100. Prop from $50, you can get an account. Barrier to entry is so low. You don't need any qualifications. You don't need anything. You can watch a YouTube video, watch Baby Pips, sign up to a prop firm. You are now a trader. What's the barrier to ent entry to be a dentist? Top grades GCSE, top grades A level. You need to go to university. Six years, exams, la, 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 la. Then you can fi finally start earning. Barrier to entry is so high. When you have an industry where the barrier to entry is super low, it's as low as it can be, but the upside is infinitely high. You can be a millionaire, billionaire, whatever, Lamborghini. When you see low barrier to entry, infinitely high upside, that is the space to sell a dream. And that's where people get caught up. And they think, get rich quick. I can get, I can, they do the maths. I need a prop firm with a million dollars and I just need to make 20% and I'm going to be super wealthy. And then just chase that. And they don't do the process, which is 50 years ago, you couldn't be a trader unless you had a net worth of at least a million dollars and you put 100K into a brokerage. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth your time. If you go back 100 years, you didn't even have brokers. You had a dealing desk or a family office. You had to be a multimillionaire. And as part of a diversified portfolio, you would hire financial advisors and they would trade for you. So it went from a super high net worth, elite activity with professionals and qualifications to just invest in a fund, to have your own broker, to $50 net worth, buy a prop firm, challenge or a trader. The industry has evolved so much, but the skill set hasn't changed one bit. You got to know what you're doing. Just because you don't need a qualification, just because you don't need to prove it to anyone, doesn't mean you should do that. Yeah. Still take that journey as it should be, which is years and years. And I can vouch for it because I've done it and it wasn't a quick thing. And I tried it I when I did have a bit of money. At times, I even was cheeky, put a bit of my rent money to try and flip an account. I, I lost that money right away, yeah. as expected. When when you build it over time, if you just give yourself two years to learn, you will eventually make that money on a prop firm, eventually. But you need that two years to learn. Yeah. If you're trying to learn and earn and flip accounts and get rich quick, you will just waste your time. And I've come across traders that have been trading for five years, 10 years, and haven't made any money. And I just say to them, man, what have you been doing for 10 years? 10 years, a long time. And you just realize they're in the same habit loop. Watch a video, buy a prop firm, watch a video, yeah. flip an like this. You gotta chaos. break that, you gotta break you gotta, the habit got... and do something else. If it's not working, you gotta change exactly it. Exactly so. Now now I want to exactly dive so. into like sort of one we'll, we'll, we'll sort of wrap this up. So I want to dive into the one minute time mm -hmm. frame though, and the sort sure. of pros and cons and the pitfalls. And you know, it is a is it is a kind of fast moving time frame. If you walk away, get a yeah. drink, you might have missed your entry. Uh, there's so many chances for you to make mistakes with mm. like, you know, even slipped orders, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. How have you managed that across the years of just trading, of getting in on a one minute? Like, are you entering a market mm. and all that sort of stuff? And then what are the sort of lessons you've got? You know, even bigger commissions on a small three to seven pips stop loss. You know, you get a lot, mm. you get a, hit, get a loss hit and you, it's not just one, it's not just that one R, it's one R plus the commission that you've paid, which could be okay. in, in reality, it could be the some, you know, almost the same size as the one R. How do you deal with mm. it? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm going to have to wrap up in like five minutes. i got to go. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's a good question. That's an important one. And I'll, I'll speak about it correctly. M1 timeframe is not for everyone. And I just just like I've said, you have to earn your lot size. You have to earn your, your account. You have to earn the right to trade a prop firm. You have to earn the right to trade M1. If you're day five of trading, don't go to the M1. Master the higher time frame. And what I say is top-down analysis and higher time frame, meaning daily, four hour, one hour, is like when you're learning to ride a bike and you have your training wheels. It's needed. You need that top down. You need the higher time frame. But when you become an advanced trader, you can take those training wheels off and focus on the M1. But don't try and learn a bike without your without your stabilizers. Learn how to ride with the stabilizers, then take them off. That's how it should be. And that just comes down to practice because the M1 moves fast. You got to know exactly what you're doing and you need to have a predefined plan. If you're coming and going on like, oh, break of structure here, supply zone, let me jump in. That's chaos. That's not a strategy. And you will just take loss after loss after loss because you can get five of those M1 break of structures 
five of them in, in the space of an hour. You can take five losses very quick. The M1 is super challenging, but it's not impossible. In fact, I've shown it now, so hopefully people can see. But it takes time. So you work your way down. Start off with M15. You won't be profitable. It's harder to be profitable on M15 alone. Then, but you're, you're, you're learning. You're not earning yet. You're just learning, practicing. Then you jump down to the M5 when M15 feels good. And then eventually down to M1. And if you're trying to do prop firm challenges and learn that process at the same time, you will blow money. But if you just give yourself a year to learn that and work your way down to M1 and then go for prop firms, way stronger. So to master M1 or the way I do it is predefined plan. I don't want to be watching like from London Open to New York close that whole time watching M1. I'll go insane. And I'll also be impulsive. I'll be like, oh, this looks like an opportunity, whatever. What I say is a profitable trader is a restricted trader. The more restrictions you have, more the more confluences, the more checkboxes you need before you take a trade, the better you'll be. So you don't want to just be going on M1 shows me this, let me jump in. So you need context, you need a, a plan, which is important to have. And the way I do it on M1 is I will always look for a manipulation. And the, I have a checklist of what manipulation is. Uh, when when I found my manipulation, I need to find a manipulation with time. It needs to be in a volatile moment. So let's say London Open. Super volatile. So that's probably one of the most volatile moments of the day. So if I see volatility and manipulation at the same time, I know I have something in my favor. And then I just need a lower time frame M1 confirmation type. I have more than 10, but just for the sake of argument, if I can see prices M1 bullish and then does that manipulation, London open, break of structure. These are, this is a trio, a nice trio. Time based manipulation, London open volatility, liquidity pools below, and the M1 break of structure. This is a good setup. So what I'd say is if you want to start getting into M1, start off small, meaning find one setup, one confluence, like main confluence type. Let's say an M1 break of structure, high time frame supply zone, and Asia high liquidity and previous days high liquidity. If you can take a trade based on just that alone, you will have at least a 60% win rate. That, that kind of model is not a hard one. And it doesn't require you to be so advanced. It's M1 break of structure. Anyone can read that. It's just knowing which M1 break of structure is relevant. Then again, you're, if you take an M1 break of structure and you, you get a correct uh, order block, let's say, your stop loss will be three to five pips. It's the M1 time frame. Now, how do you risk manage that and, and factor your slippage in commission? Because it's important. And I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a hidden tax that no one considers. And they, they just think, oh, I need to risk $500 in this trade. Let me take 15 lot size. Mm. And then they, they take a loss and they're like, oh, I lost $600. What the hell? Well, you realize <laughs> yeah. you paid commission. You have spread. So you have to factor that in. So if I'm doing 1% risk, my lot size is inclusive of my spread and inclusive of my commission. So I know um, I'm paying $7 per lot size. So if I'm doing 10 lots, I will pay $70. Win or loss, I will pay $70. If I have a $500 budget for a, for a loss, I can't put a lot size of $500. I've got to put a lot size of $400 plus that commission. And then obviously factor in spread. Depending on your broker, I prefer a raw spread account you got to factor that in. And therefore, when you do take a loss, it's not a surprise of, oh, loss plus commissions. It's a loss inclusive of commissions. That's critical. Brilliant. Hey, look, I, I know we're out of time here. This has been fantastic. In fact, it's probably an interview people have to listen to again. And it is kind of sums up almost every single interview I've done here. You've covered everything. So, Waka, yes. thank you very much for coming on. It's been awesome. Um, and I know you're going to do a chart breakdown for us as well later on. So uh, to wrap up, what's the best way for traders to get hold of you? So right now, I think if you want to see the transparency and, and my real trading, go ahead and watch my Twitter. It's just my name, Wakara Sim 10 I'm going to continue to do these signals for a while and leave a legacy. I want to come on and show Twitter, like I've done one year of signals, six years, of, six months of signals, and I pulled out 100% in front of your eyes. No one can say anything. That's a legacy statement. That's my mission for now. And my YouTube channel, uh, that's where I go deep. So in, in Twitter, I'll just throw screenshots and comments. But in YouTube videos, that's where I can speak 30 minutes breaking down one trade and showing you the full details on M1 and so forth. Those will be the two main places. And again, my YouTube channel and my Twitter is enough for any trader to learn. You don't need courses. You don't need anything more than that. That should be enough of a resource. And that's my mission statement to kind of speak to my younger self. What my younger self would have needed, that's what I want to bring to the game. Lovely. Love it. Absolutely brilliant. So what we'll do, folks, we'll hook a link up to his show notes below this video or in the podcast description. So a big thank you to Waka for sharing everything with us today. Um, until next time, I wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. All right, folks, there you have an interview done and dusted. I, I, as I said at the end, this is a, such an epic interview. You probably need to go and watch it or listen to it a couple of times to really let all that advice sink in. There is so much in here. It's almost all you need as a trader. Now, uh, what we did after this was break down 
what he does on a price chart. We went over a week of his trades that he'd actually caught out on Telegram. So there is proof that these trades have been taken. And we go into a lot of detail around why he got in and how he got out. So folks, this is an epic breakdown. We're actually going to drop this video in two parts. It's so long. Um, but the first part is coming up this week. So stay tuned. It's all here on Trading Nut. Have a great trading week and we'll see you in the next one.